Good evening. My name is Melvin McInnes, and I am the Thomas B. and Nancy Upjohn Woodworth Professor of Bipolar Disorder here at the University of Michigan. I'm also the director of the Heinz C. Bipolar Research uh, Program. And I want to welcome you to this evening's webinar on bipolar disorder, then and now. Uh, we're very excited for the evening. We have a really terrific panel that's going to be discussing bipolar disorder, the research here at the University of Michigan, and the future of where we're going uh, in the research and in um, clinical uh, programs. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, this is who I am, and I'm the director uh, of the program and uh, here to welcome you the, this evening. And uh, as we start out, I have a few housekeeping issues to, to take care of. Uh, firstly, the practice program is committed to accessible webinars. And so we have the option here of turning on the closed captioning uh, at the bottom of your screen to be able to turn that on, you'll be able to see the text. And as the panelists and presenters are presenting or talking or responding, they will do their best to remember to state their names before speaking. And it just helps identify who the individual is that that's talking. So the agenda for this evening is uh, just a kind of a forum and, and panel discussion. Uh, we've been doing a number of these events over the past several years, and uh, both in person and now most recently online. So we're um, uh, delighted to have you here to review a little bit about what bipolar disorder is, to think about the history of bipolar, fascinating history of um, of the features in the clinical presentations of bipolar, features of it then, and then to talk about a modern approach to integrating the research and uh, the clinical care. I wanna tell you a little bit more about the Prechter Bipolar Research Program as an integrative model uh, to approach bipolar disorder. The key features of our program are networking, collaboration, and open science. The flagship study that we have is called the Longitudinal Study of Bipolar Disorder. And essentially the research in this study is really guided by the clinical patterns. We're uh, focused on the clinical features of bipolar disorder. We're focused on learning more about what causes people to become ill, what causes them or makes it possible for them to become uh, better and, and live well. And we're now embarking on what we view to be an exciting approach to learning more about bipolar disorder, and that is learn using a learning health systems approach, wherein we're active in the clinics and learning what works for individuals and learning how we can apply uh, our knowledge of bipolar disorder more quickly than we have in the past. As I mentioned, uh, bipolar disorder has fascinating history. There is a philosopher and physician, uh, Arteus of Cappadocia in the second century, who noted that melancholia, they had these words there, melancholia and mania were essentially two forms of the same disease. And this is an image of, um, of the early physician. And he pointed out that mania manifests as euphoria, but in other individuals, they display these furious rages. And then for the melancholics or the depressive individuals, he pointed out that it's possible for them to fly into rages. And so this is the beginning of what we call the, the mixed affective state uh, at that time. French physician Jean-Pierre Faure in the mid 19th century described something referred to as la folie circulaire, or the circular uh, folly or, or madness. Uh, and also the concept of an anxious melancholy. It's a picture here of uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Felre, And he noted at the time that there was individuals often expressed a constant pacing or an inner turmoil. And that he again talked about mixed states being present in, uh, in individuals. The person who really influenced the conceptualization of what we now know as bipolar disorder was Emil Kraepelin, a German psychiatrist at the turn of the last century. And he really introduced and coined the term manic depressive illness or manic depressive disorder, which was the 
uh, earlier term for the illness. And uh, Kraepelin noted that there was, a, there was an ongoing variation of affect and that he considered manic depressive disorder as an illness essentially of affect and that affect really was, really was composed of three primary elements. There was a volition, a drive or an energy, gets us up in the day and keeps us, um, keeps us on track uh, as we're doing our work and living our lives. Emotions and moods and sort of the happy sadness, uh, happiness and sadness that individuals feel. And he also noted there was a cognitive or an intellectual component to it and cognitive and intellectual here in the sense of just either you're thinking fast or thinking slow or you have a positive or negative component to the thinking. And he noted, you can see my mouse here, if you think of this as the passage of time, that these three elements of, of, um, uh, of affect could be cycling in their own pattern. So they didn't all necessarily have to hit the same spot or cycle at the same time. So this was this is the idea that sort of volition can be up and, and emotion can be down. So you're going to have someone with a lot of energy uh, and yet be in a low mood. So this translates into rage that earlier, earlier describers of bipolar disorder uh, talked about. The concept of bipolar disorder was really first offered as a concept in, in about 1957 by a German physician, Carl Leonard, uh, who talked about bipolar versus unipolar depression. And um, this is a picture of, uh, of him. So he passed away only relatively recently in 1988. So bipolar disorder in the current times was really influenced profoundly by the emergence of, uh, of DSM-3, the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, third edition. And in this DSM-3, the diagnoses were operationalized, meaning that they had a kind of a checklist against which you would compare uh, the, the symptoms of the, of the individual and say, if they met the certain criteria or the number of these, these symptoms that they would qualify for the diagnosis. So this is criticized at some levels, many levels, that it was kind of a bit of a checklist approach, and um, but it was done in good faith, and it was meant to really attempt to destigmatize uh, mental illness. The uh, concept of a maniac was considered to be derogatory, and they really wanted to differentiate from the daily use of depression. We talk about depression in, in daily terms. Oh, it was very depressing to go to see that movie, for example. Uh, and now in modern times or most recent times, it's in the, the fifth edition, DSM-5, and the, the um, five there in, in, the, in the Arabic five is, is uh, anticipating the fact that there'll be 5.1, 5.2, and, and so on. So that's my understanding is why that is. But the, really the important change uh, that came about in DSM-5 was that energy, energy was, uh, was, was absolutely required to be a diagnosed or notable described feature of mania. So the amount of energy that the individual has was considered to be, to be fundamental and required to, to be present um, in, in the manic state. So you know, the person that experiencing mania, they're, they're bursting with energy often. So what about bipolar disorder today? Well, bipolar disorder uh, affects si over 6 million uh, Americans. It is the sixth leading cause of disability worldwide. It's a very uh, significant series of problems. The economic cost of bipolar disorder in the US alone is more than 2 billion, 2 billion with a B. And the about 25% of that cost is direct care costs. So this includes hospitalizations, physicians costs, nursing costs, uh, and, and you know emergency room, uh, you know anything that has to do with direct care. But significantly, and and anyone who lives with bipolar disorder or lives in a family where bipolar disorder is will appreciate that the economic cost is profound in terms of lost productivity all the necessary services, the lost uh, time that care providers uh, have and the disability payments and so on. So all major companies, larger corporations, a significant amount of their disability cost is related to 
to you know, things like bi illnesses such as bipolar disorder and depression. Now, one of the things that, that causes me great sadness is to know that, that, uh, that bipolar disorder ends up shortening the lifespan overall. And so the numbers, if you look at a larger population and sort of looking at you know, the averages, then the average lifespan of some of the bipolar disorder is shortened by in the range of nine to 10 or 11 years. And very sadly, 15% uh, of individuals uh, die by suicide. And there's a, a large number of co-occurring co occurring medical illness, such as heart disease, that co-occur uh, with bipolar disorder. Now, when we're talking about what bipolar disorder is, uh, we distinguish between bipolar 1 disorder and the characterizing feature of bipolar 1 disorder is the manic episode, which goes to this pathological increase in energy. And by pathological increase in energy, I mean really uh, a pathological increase in energy. This is not just someone having you know, kind of a happy day. This is someone with the amount of energy um, bursting inside of them that just, uh, just it seems to be nonstop and they're just buzzing all over the place and are just bursting with energy. And, get themselves into um, a variety of circumstances that seriously can cause uh, grave danger to them and, and to them in their person and their social and, and vocational um, um, uh, lives. And so it's typically incapacitating. In other words, the individual is unable to continue performing their primary and secondary roles, whether it's at their job or in their family uh, or elsewhere. We also talk about bipolar 2 disorder, and we call that was the hypomanic episode, hypo just being um, under uh, mania. And hypomania has a significant change in, in, uh, in energy. It's less severe than mania, and it can result in significant changes in behavior, notably risk-taking. So somebody could be driving too fast or investing carelessly in the stock market or, or getting involved in activities that could result in a significant um, uh, difficulties in their personal, social, and vocational lives. So depression is very common in both bipolar 1 disorder and bipolar, bipolar 2 disorder. And unfortunately, it's frequently the most, often the most common challenge faced by those that live with bipolar disorder. And, and it's singularly one of the most difficult things to, to manage uh, over, the, over the course of time, it's keeping people well. And often the depression is in, at a chronic low grade level and, and, um, and fluctuating over time. And so it can be very difficult um, to, um, to live with. So I mentioned to you that I'm the director of the Heinz P. Prechter Bipolar Research Program, and we, uh, the, the origins of this program uh, began uh, following the death of, by suicide by Heinz Prechter. Heinz lived with bipolar disorder. Heinz was a successful, a brilliant businessman, but most importantly, he was very dedicated to his community, to his family, and to humanity in general. And this is a picture of Heinz that I think is just one of the most touching pictures, a man beaming, uh, standing in the car. And he established and founded the American Sunroof Company. And his company here in Southeast Michigan put all the sunroofs in, in the majority of cars coming out of the big three uh, for years and years. Following Heinz's death, the family recognized the urgency for new knowledge and treatments in bipolar disorder. And they established the Prechter Program, the Prechter Bipolar Research Program at the University of Michigan, really to engage the community of those living with bipolar disorder in our common mission. This is our, our symbol. Community is a major theme uh, of the Prechter Program. We're dedicated to community and we're very honored to have you here with us this evening to, to hear about uh, our program. We talk about the participant collaborators living with bipolar who are engaged in research with us. Community outreach is part of our culture. We maintain, a, a, I think, a very a, a great website. Uh, we have off the frequent communications, and we like to host events and reach out and engage with the with the community. And frequently and pre-pandemic, we would have these in person, and it was a delight to meet so many wonderful people in, in our community. 
partnership with community-minded supporters and donors are really a significant source of, uh, of our support. And, and uh, I just want to talk about um, how, uh, how affirming it is to the individuals that live with bipolar disorder to know of the support that is being given to support the research in the illness. And they think, you know, so, somebody is supporting the work on, on the disease that I have. It's incredibly inspiring to the early career researchers who know that there's money being raised to uh, stimulate the research that they're, they're in. And it's, it's just so motivating uh, to have that to know about this and to know about the community partnership that we have. And so uh, we're incredibly grateful to the Prechter family for, the, for their research. And there's so many uh, people that have uh, contributed and supported us. And, and uh, uh, the Richard Tam Foundation is, is one of them. I know that Judy Tam is, is uh, with us this evening listening. So thank you, Judy, and so many others that have supported the program. And I want to share with you our strategy as to how we, how we uh, approach, approach this. So firstly, our vision, why are we doing this? What is our vision for the future? And I'm going to be challenging our, our panel members about you know, what's going to, what, where do they see this going in five and 10 years from time? So our vision is simply that every individual who lives with bipolar disorder can lead a healthy and productive life. We're convinced of that. And our mission is really, I bolded our words here. Mission is to discover mechanisms, the mechanisms that contribute to bipolar disorder and help us predict and improve outcomes, develop effective and innovative treatments. So this is a, these are, these are, um, these are, these are big goals and big, uh, large mission. And our flagship study, the study that we base our research on is the longitudinal study of bipolar disorder. And we have over 1400 individuals engaged in this study. And it's a, it's a detailed study of, of individuals living with bipolar disorder and unaffected controls. And so we study multiple elements uh, of, the, of the illness. We study the disease. Do they have bipolar disorder? Uh, what are their abilities from a neurocognitive perspective, personality, behaviors, circadian patterns, life story and outcomes? And so we have connection with their participants uh, every two months. And so these are dedicated people. I remember I called them our participant collaborators. And so they really, they like to know what's going on. They like to learn about what, what the progress is. And we have uh, on, at any given time in the range between 900 and 1,000 active participants. And so you know, participating in research is not for everybody and, and we've been going on for, for a very long time. So remember I talked about bipolar disorder being a, um, a pathology of energy. And so this is what, uh, what I'm referring to uh, pathology of energy. This is just this. Uh, and when we talk about bipolar disorder, we talk about mania, we talk about depression. And when we're talking to our mentees, uh, we show that these are you know, dynamic states and we say it's a nice sine wave going forward over time. But in fact, when we, when we, when we really see uh, bipolar disorder in the clinic and what you're seeing here in this graph is a time period of one year and the severity scores of mania and depression are mania in blue and depression in red here. And so you can see an individual going forward over time, their symptoms are going up and down. They're not this like this beautiful sine wave here over time. So life with bipolar disorder can be very hectic. And so this individual week to week is varying in their symptoms of, of depression and mania sometimes you know, and, and some stages, you know, they're experiencing both um, features of both at the same time. So it's very, it can be very disruptive uh, at the individual level. And so one of the goals that we have is, can we anticipate change uh, in, the, uh, in, this, in, in the study? Uh, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. So as I said, we uh, we think of bipolar disorder as a complex human uh, condition. So there's a disease. Is there depression? Are there mania symptoms going on? What about the life story? What happened at the individual level? Did they experience uh, an abusive uh, childhood? What happened over the course of time? What are the series of life events that they experience? What about their neurocognitive functioning? On neurocognitive, just means the you know, ability to to you know, executive functioning, the ability to reason, to do arithmetic, and and uh, and, um, and and that sort of thing. What about their temperament and their personality? Our temperament and personality, you know, influences how we manifest disease. Some people are stoics, others uh, others less so. 
Uh, what about motivated behaviors? What about things like uh, you know, motivation to use uh, substances or alcohol, which is very common in bipolar disorder? What about their sleep and circadian patterns? And they're just general responses to medications and other treatments. All of these things are important at an individual level to understand the complexity of bipolar disorder. And all of these features contribute to the, uh, to the illness. So we must pay attention to so many different things in bipolar disorder. And so we start when we have a rational approach to understanding the illness. And this is what is done at the level of a clinical assessment as well. And so our research, as I mentioned, really fo follows the clinical, um, the clinical patterns. So we start with the individual. We have the observations, the clinical observations at the individual level. And we have the various different intermediates that I showed you, the disease, for example, temperament, personality, life story, all these different things that we have to, that we gather. And then underlying everything, there are these drivers disciplines, the, the scientific disciplines that contribute to all of the features of the intermediates that ultimately contribute to the clinical expressions. And to give you an example of genetics, genetics contributes to so many different things. It contributes to neurocognitive function, temperament, personality. So what I want to give you is just the, the complexity of the approach that we need to take to bipolar disorder, uh, because it is far more uh, complex than just saying, yes, you have the illness or no, you don't have the illness. There's much more, many more things to, uh, to consider. So what do we need in the field? We need more bipolar researchers. We need more care providers. Uh, the funding patterns in academic uh, settings have generally favored uh, schizophrenia and depression over the years. The industry, the pharmaceutical industry, has fewer products in the pipeline for bipolar. Many medicines that are out there are developed fundamentally for schizophrenia, and then they're tried in, bi in bipolar disorder. Primary care physicians are wonderful individuals, and they do just heroic work, but many are reluctant to take on individuals with bipolar disorder. So I mentioned to you, we're talking about how we stimulate the research in the bipolar uh, in the bi in the Prector bipolar uh, program. And uh, this is what somebody called your bubble uh, figure. And so here in the center uh, are, is the Prector bipolar um, uh, research program. And we work with labs in the Department of Psychiatry here. Uh, we have five labs uh, and um, uh, Sarah's lab is the Emote lab, and we work with these labs. We try to spot, help them, you know, get their projects going in relationship to uh, to bipolar disorder. Networking is a fundamental feature of what we do. Uh, it is so important to engage other individuals and other expertise, other people with expertise in bipolar research. We have cell and developmental biology, pharmacology, we have computer science and engineering, so many different labs that we work with. And we work in a collaborative manner. We work, uh, work with others to try uh, and get projects going that will work towards solving bipolar polar uh, related problems. We work in an open science manner. And so we share our data. We have a person who's specialized really in our program that works on, on, um, on agreements and data, data sharing agreements. So there are 13 labs that are networked here at the University of Michigan uh, in relationship to the bipolar program. We have a growing international network and these, these, colors, uh, they, these colors here. So uh, when you think about all of the issues and challenges in bipolar disorder, I mentioned that the funding stream is actually you know, consistent considerably less for independent research in bipolar disorder comparedly to schizophrenia or major depression. And so one of the things that we've been doing in the PECTA program is really to invest. We think of ourselves as investing in projects in cell biology. Sue O'Shea uh, in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology has got a wonderful program going in, um, in induced pluripotent stem cells modeling bipolar disorder. We have individuals in computer sciences that are modeling bipolar disorder using and an analyzing speech patterns. And we have a, a, a strong team that's looking in at bipolar disorder from a neurophysiological perspective, looking at uh, various different um, elements of the, how the brain works in a neurophysiological patterns. And so we work on you know, stimulating their research and we work on helping them getting to get more funding and to get more projects uh, going. So we're, we're kind of a catalyst in, 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 that, uh, in that way. 
So I wanted to end here with uh, talking about some of the innovations in the care model for bipolar disorder. So I talked about you know, the importance of networking, of collaborations in open science. And one of the things that I think is really exciting going forward is this learning health system. And so this is a dynamic approach to learning how to implement ideas in the clinic and interacting with the research uh, level uh, and, and, and working with the community to identify the priorities. And so you can see here, that the learning cycles, we want to have knowledge to performance, we want to implement something, we want to test that performance, test the data, turn that data into knowledge, and then continuing on in this learning cycle. So this, this is the way that we're working towards working with the community, working with the care providers, working uh, uh, to um, uh, learn more what works and what doesn't work for, uh, for, for bipolar disorder. So what is, where, where are we today? Bipolar disorder is a serious condition and attention must be paid, but there are many, opera uh, many options that are available for managing bipolar disorder. And there's a but in every kind of statement here, but takes years to find the best route. I told one of my patients said the other you know, a year ago when we finally got, uh, got her on the right medication, which was lithium. And she said, why didn't somebody tell me this or try this 14 years ago? And you take a long time to get the right medication. There are many approaches to the condition, but no multiple domains to consider. And there are uh, there's the illness orientation, what medications are going to work. Uh, there's a life story personality perspective, what psychotherapies are, and what type of psychotherapies are, 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 are helpful. We have sleep and circadian patterns that we need to focus on. And there's sleep focused therapies that, that uh, individuals can, can, can adopt. The research approach you know, in bipolar disorder and in the now in the 21st century really must be aligned with the clinical priorities. And we, but at the same time, we need to consider multiple domains uh, as, we, as we go through and, and proceed in our, in our research program. And I talked to you about these, these multiple domains that we have. So I am so delighted to introduce to you uh, the panel. We've got a phenomenal panel this evening that is going to be talking about uh, bipolar disorder and talking about uh, where we are with, uh, with the research. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and the panelists are going to uh, come on and they're going to introduce themselves. And I want to thank everyone who sent in questions. We've got a big long list of questions and um, I'm, I'm going to do my best to get a lot of these questions uh, out and um, and get them uh, get them get them um, to the panel to discuss. So, whoop, nice. Uh, thank you. So, I'm just going to call upon the panel members as I see them on my screen. So, Meg, you're in my uh, in my uh, my Hollywood squares here. So, I'm going to call upon you first. Okay, great. Thanks, Melvin. Hi, I'm Meg Leduc. Um, Today, I live in Rochester Hills with my husband. I'm a marketing and communications manager for a nonprofit. I'm a graduate of the University of Michigan. I've been a bipolar research, longitudinal research participant for the past 14 years. And um, right now I'm pursuing a master's in fine arts. Wonderful, thank you. And Dr. Sarah Sperry. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm Sarah Sperry, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at University of Michigan um, and came here really specifically to work with the Proctor program to improve our research and clinical care uh, for individuals living with bipolar disorder. And one of the things I forgot to ask was that to remind you is that we're going to in, in the introduction you're going to tell us you know your vision of where we would be in five years. So I'll just uh, I'll come back to you momentarily, Meg. But uh, Sarah, uh, Dr. Sperry, sorry. Sure. So one of the main um, missions of, of my research really is to think about how we can personalize care. So in the past, you know, one individual with bipolar disorder was viewed the same as another individual with bipolar disorder and the same treatment must work for everybody with you know, bipolar one disorder and bipolar two disorder. But what we know is that every individual is very, very different and, and every individual deserves 
a personalized intervention strategy. And so the goal of my work is to, how can we build assessments and monitoring systems to know what works for whom and when, and develop more personalized interventions to focus on areas of concern for that individual. Terrific, terrific. So five years ago. From now, hopefully, I can do that. <laughs> Five years from now, yeah, I'm sure that's going to happen. Uh, Dr. Segar Parikh, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Segar Parikh. I'm a professor of psychiatry and head of the Depression Clinical and Clinical Research Programs. Uh, I've had the honor of working with people with bipolar disorder for 30 years in both Canada and the United States. And uh, I'm interested in all things treatment related. And uh, you know, particularly when you think about where are we going and where will we be uh, five years from now? Well, number one, I think uh, I'm hoping that the digital revolution will have more fully arrived so that we have more apps and digital tools to help monitor uh, our moods and give us coping strategies and that we have better medications to help manage bipolar depression. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And so Christine uh, Grimm, um, please. Hi, my name is Christine Grimm. I'm a registered nurse with the Prechter Bipolar Research Program, and I'm enthusiastic to contribute to the systems-based approaches to improving access to psychiatric care. And so I would say within five years, I envision an enhanced collaborative care approach among academic medical institutions and community providers in helping to improve treatments for bipolar disorder. Thank you. So I want to start out the the um, uh, discussions here just with, from the, from some of our questions, and one of them relates to, or it's kind of, a number of them relate to substances. And there's uh, you know kind of either marijuana, there's uh, alcohol, and a number of questions around uh, you know kind of other other substances and and that that are that are. Um, that people are subject to be using, you know, over the course of time, and so I just want to ask the panel to you know, to to start addressing that. And so, you know, um, and if 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 we're all comfortable using first names, so Sarah, uh, tonight tonight we're all uh, we're all on a first name basis uh, here, and so Sarah, do you want to start the discussion? So substances and and bipolar disorder, where are we with that? Sure. So um, <laughs> this is an area of specific interest to me, um, so much so that I, I went and got specialized training in substance use treatment because I wanted to work with individuals with bipolar disorder. Um, anywhere upwards of about 60% of people who live with bipolar disorder at some point in their life will have an alcohol or a substance use disorder. And so, um, you know, where we've been is that these individuals have historically been excluded from research studies and clinical trials because they have both. And so we don't know what's contributing to what. Um, so a lot of the treatments we've developed, uh, we don't know if they work for people who are experiencing both. And so one of the explicit goals of my research and for the Proctor program going forward is that we, you know, we specifically bring these people into our community and ask them what's working for them and what's not working for them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you. And Meg, uh, uh, so from, from your perspective, I and mean, you've gone through a lot of, uh, you know, educational experiences and as a student, uh, you know, in that, uh, um, can you give us your perspective if, uh, you know, on, you know, what, what substances were, would, would, you know, were you confronted with and, and how, how have you, uh, what, what has been your observations with this and in, in, in relationship to the lived experience? Well, my dad is a judge. So he drilled into me, do not use substances. But I noticed in the chat, food is a substance. Mm -hmm. And for me, a co-occurring eating disorder was an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it was only as an adult that I began to eat normally. Um, so if other people on the panel can, can address co-occurring eating disorders. That will. That's a great, uh, great question. And so, what I want to, I want to, um, uh, to just to ask for for Sagar, just with regards to, you know, the therapeutic uses of some of these substances are now being um, brought into discussion. Some of them about therapeutic uses. So, could you perhaps address the therapeutic uses of at least wide range of substances that are kind of out there? Well, I guess everybody's favorite 
so-called therapeutic drug or, or, or is some version of marijuana, since it's legal in many different places. Um, what we do know is uh, that uh, there are certain drugs like cocaine and amphetamines that are absolutely toxic uh, to individuals with bipolar disorder. Marijuana is not anywhere near that bad, uh, but it doesn't, it's not a treatment for mania and it's not a treatment for bipolar depression. That much we do know. Uh, it's not terribly toxic in bipolar disorder, but the paradox is that mo most people with bipolar disorder have anxiety or sleep problems or both. And marijuana, uh, uh, you know, popularly is understood to be useful uh, for either anxiety or for sleep. And so there are many individuals with bipolar disorder who perhaps get frustrated with normal medicines and turn to marijuana. And so mm -hmm. I see that as where it's being used a lot. We don't really have evidence that it's uh, you know, good or bad per se, specifically for those symptoms. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that is a very common uh, use. Right. Uh, so, Christine, in, 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 in your um, experience in, in talking with many families, uh, that do you, do you run into issues related to substance abuse and, and, uh, frequently? Yeah, definitely. Um, oftentimes, when there are substances being heavily used, it just it does over, overall destabilize the picture of the illness, and um, it causes a lot of um, frustration and stress for families to figure out exactly what um, Dr. Sperry was saying regarding, um, you know, what, what is causing what, uh, it, you know, adds a layer of complexity um, to sorting through um, the issues. Right. And, and so to that point, we, we don't really understand an awful lot about it, but I'm interested in the level of, of severity. And so Dr. Sperry, we talked to address, uh, if you will, uh, you know, there's a difference between one drink and, 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 um, and 20 drinks. And there's a difference between, you know, one puff of marijuana and, um, you know, and, and, and smoking throughout the day. How do, how do, how do these patterns emerge in bipolar disorder? So that's a that's a great question and and something that I'm actually exploring in our longitudinal data right now. Um, and and what I can tell you hot off the press is that even kind of mild to moderate drinking in our individuals with bipolar disorder is predicting more impairment, more depression, um, overall, you know, worse course, even though these people aren't having both a bipolar disorder and a diagnosed mm -hmm. alcohol use disorder. Um, so, you know, I, at least when it comes to alcohol, um, you know, what is mild and moderate, it, you know, that's a complicated answer. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that there is some evidence that that frequent consistent use of, of alcohol is associated with worse outcomes. Um, yeah. 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 No. And there's no quite no question uh, about that. And it's it's uh, it's 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 very variable. Now, Meg pointed out there is uh, you know, and, and someone in the chat um, also mentioned that you know, food uh, can be challenging and problematic uh, in the sense of you know, eating disorders. And that there's the uh, there's part of what the way we approach bipolar disorder is to look at the motivated behaviors and and uh, and so potentially you know, overeating or starving or just having an eating problem. Uh, could be in sort of in the class of uh, of a um, of um, um, a motivated behavior, and so it, as a psychologist, uh, Sarah, this sort of falls in your in your domain, and I want to get other perspectives uh, on this as well. Could but you start the conversation about eating disorders and bipolar? Sure. So. I come at this direction from an idea about emotion regulation. So one thing we know is that many individuals living with bipolar disorder um, react more strongly to emotions and don't always have um, the same coping tools that, that others do. And so there's this concept called urgency where when experiencing high levels of emotions, we wanna do things right now impulsively to get rid of that or to pursue that. And so much of the work that's looked at eating pathology and bipolar disorder has looked at it under this vein of, of impulsivity, of lack of um, response in the face of, of experiencing strong emotions. And so from that end, we think a lot about binge eating. We think a lot about, um, you know, 
having control over emotion. And so if control, if I can get that control by choosing not to eat. And so I view it very much as this motivated behavior in reaction to um, emotion or internal senses that aren't comfortable. Fascinating, fascinating. Thank you. And uh, so, Sagar, in terms of managing these, the the tumultuous nature of emotions and roller coasters uh, of emotion, could you speak to potentially, uh, from a medical perspective, you know, medications or how, what role does medication play in in this kind of uh, tumultuous and um, kind of emotional and mood patterns? Well, uh, just before we address emo- uh, medications, I think we have to acknowledge that coping skills are really the crux and and at the heart of coping skills are having regular sleep wake cycles and other kinds of natural rhythms uh, that really establish a, a much more healthy baseline uh, regardless of whether we have bipolar disorder or not uh, these are absolutely critical for optimal human functioning mm-hmm. now if we've paid attention to that uh, and and uh, we want to add medications uh, you know, unlike depression and anxiety, where uh, the sort of psychological precipitants can drive the illness very strongly and can entirely uh, treat the, the symptoms, um, you know, psychological treatments alone cannot treat bipolar depression or, or, or mania. So this is one disorder where the psychotherapy is necessary, but it's not sufficient to control the illness. So Uh, Mood stabilizing medicine, and people have heard of, of course, lithium and uh, other things like uh, valproic acid, uh, and and more recently, uh, medicines that were originally discovered for schizophrenia, but then found to be useful in bipolar disorder. These are medicines known as atypical antipsychotics. All of these are core treatments for bipolar disorder, and many of them work both in depression and in mania, and also help prevent flare-ups. And they are essential, and they're essential even when a person feels well, because they're not only treating symptoms, but they're preventing relapses. And the more relapses or episodes you have, the more your brain cells are vulnerable to easily being tipped into a new episode. So it's really important not to say, oh, well, you know, I'm fine, therefore I don't need medicines, because the illness can be quiet naturally for months or years at a time anyway, it's important to know that there is a vulnerability and that the medicines can also help prevent a relapse and prevent a, a kind of a worsening of, of the course of illness. So that, that takes us, thank you very much, Sagar. So that takes us to the question that came up. So are drug free, drug-free treatments uh, possible? And um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in perspectives and particularly, you know, from the from you know from a clinician's point of view, I often see patients uh, are people that have been years without medications and, you know, and they have a strategy to, uh, you know, it seems to do that. So, so Meg, um, you know, and that in, in, in your spheres, do people talk about drug-free um, uh, you know, treatments or is that something that, that um, has been talked about in your groups? You know, actually not for me. I'm just committed to the fact that I must remain on medication for the rest of my life, you know, and that, this is something I do every day. Um, and this is a knowledge that I have for the rest of my life. This is ongoing. Um, and I'm committed to that fact. Perfect. Uh, that's, that's great. Now, uh, medications have kind of a, a variety of different uh, challenges uh, in their own right. And people are talking about, you know, various different side effects and that. And so, Christine, in, in interacting with, uh, you know, the individuals and the families that you've uh, interacted with, take me through kind of the the discussions that you have with people when they say, you know, I'm so frustrated with my medication and I'm so frustrated with this. And so, uh, you know, this is a, a real, a real thing that people get really upset and get side effects. And how, how do we manage through all this? Yeah, that's that's a great point. I think um, I think that there's a few things here that uh, that you're talking about. One, one overall that that patients often express frustration around is having to, as Dr. Freak recommends, you know, uh, adhering to a regular sleep schedule, making sure they get exercise, making sure, you know, taking their medication on time. It's sort of um, the discipline that comes behind having to manage 
um, bipolar disorder can be exhausting, frustrating, um, something that you'd like to kind of experiment with taking a break from a holiday, you know, vacation holiday from. Um, and so I think the, the, the key here, I think, is for, for individuals to start to really track and be aware of mood fluctuations and triggers over time, because most people come back, like Meg says, and, and, and realize that even though, you know, it took a little while to get to the right, you know, titrated dose, um, and maybe, you know, had some GI upset or some, you know, it wasn't so pleasant. Um, if they stick with it, they find that they do feel better and they're able to have a higher quality of life um, overall um, when they stick to the routine, even though it can be a little boring. That's right. uh, really, really terrific. And, and so sticking to the routine. So Sarah, you know, I know that in your work that you're dealing with people and, and have focused set psychotherapies. And so uh, I have a couple of questions regarding, you know, what is a good routine? How do you how do we in, in the psychotherapy domain and, and work with the interaction with, you know, the med, med, medicines and psychotherapy? And do you find yourself uh, figuring, you know, d d developing strategies for the individual to you know, work with the medications or, you know, how, there's a lot of work in that, in that domain and, and, and helping people find the way forward times. So. Yeah, it, it can be really difficult because as you, as you mentioned earlier, some of these medications have side effects that make keeping those regular, uh, regular schedules difficult. So for example, if people are on higher levels of atypical antipsychotics, they might have a lot of um, fatigue in the morning and not want to get out of bed and stay in bed and, and, and therefore aren't getting up at their, their target time. Um, and, and we call these social rhythms, right? These are the things that we, that we encounter and do throughout our days that help and train what's called our circadian rhythm, which is a 24 hour clock we have in our mm -hmm. body or mm -hmm. our brain. And so what we do know is that individuals living with bipolar disorder, many, um, have, some difficulties kind of keeping that 24 hour clock um, set the same way every day. And so when our behaviors and our social rhythms during the day are kind of all over the place, this night we're going to bed at 2 a.m., this night we're going to bed at 10, this day we're waking up at 6 a.m., this day we're waking up at 12, that um, our brain is having a really hard time keeping that 24 hour clock. And so in psychotherapy, one of the things that we work on, it's, it's a therapy called interpersonal and social rhythms therapy is how can we kind of find these ideal social rhythms for you? So when do you feel most well? Well, maybe you feel most well when you're waking up at 8 a.m. and going to bed at 11 p.m. Okay, we've found that. So our goal for the next two weeks to a month is to try to keep to that schedule. And I want you to monitor your mood. And I want to be able to show you on a graph that when you try to keep that schedule, your mood is more stable. And so it's, it's I, I view it as a collaborative process of, of testing out hypotheses, seeing that data, mm -hmm. sharing that back with my clients and recognizing that I have to work with the medications they're on that might make those things more difficult. And so we need to be flexible. That's right, terrific. And so, so with that flexibility and thinking through this, uh, Meg, I'm, I'm very. Uh, there's a lot of quite a number of questions that focus on, uh, you know, kind of uh, how do you separate? Like one question just says, how do you separate your diagnosis from your everyday life, and is it possible? And how do you? Uh, what is the relationship between stress and bipolar disorder? So there's a lot of everyday questions. So people are really interested to know uh, how how how. How, how does one get through the day with this? And so Meg, take, take it can us through be the- difficult. It can be <laughs> so very city. difficult. It uh, is, it is. Um, I think building up things you love that are outside the illness mm -hmm. is, are so important. You know, when finding those passions that drive you that have nothing to do with the illness. And um, like, what, what gets you out of bed? Um, is it your job? Is it your loved one? Is it your child? Um, uh, and is it is it a walk in the park? Like give yourself those small moments daily um, that you can enjoy and you'll build a life worth living. Um, that is so key day by day. 
Mm. No, that's great. And so that what it is, what I'm hearing that it's it's a it's a personal experience, and it's building one's you know life and putting together you know things going forward in a in a rational way with you know waking up and figuring out what the priorities are uh, for the day and that. Uh, what wonderful! I, you know, we're in this pandemic. We're still still in the pandemic, uh, and so there's a number of questions here around the pandemic and how has the pandemic affected things? How has it affected students? How has it affected life in general? And so, uh, so Christine, do you want to start the discussion about you know what what have you noticed in in interacting with them? Um, with with folks and you know connect, con connecting with us and our participants, how has the pandemic affected things? I would definitely say just increased isolation overall. People feeling less connected um, and some dissatisfaction with uh, the lack of um, you know face to face um, access to care um, during the pandemic. Um, for some, that's really crucial. Um, so that's been challenging. Yeah, indeed. And so that's with the face to face to care uh, challenge. Uh, you know, I know, Sagar, that you've been going in and, and seeing people now frequently in the, in, in the, in the outpatient clinic. Uh, and, and there's a number of questions here that are asking about treatments and specifically about new treatments. And, you know, there was a question about uh, what's called the Stanford, um, you know, protocol, which I'm, I'm assuming is the SAINT protocol for the Theta Burst DTMS, but the uh, RTMS. But there's also questions about ECT and other uh, kind of physical neuromodulatory types of um, uh, studies that are on the rise. And so I'd like your perspective on, on what's new in that in these domains. Well, the, the, the biggest piece of good news is that uh, in the last five years, there's been a resurgence of interest in developing new treatments. We had reached a plateau maybe 10 years ago, particularly in medications, but also in brain stimulation techniques. Um, but in the last five years in particular, uh, you know, two or three uh, developments have been there. One is a new class of medications. Most people have heard of ketamine uh, that works in a different way than traditional antidepressants. It's been mostly studied in regular depression, not in bipolar depression, but uh, there are some studies underway and some preliminary results that are encouraging about ketamine, but it spurred many other medicines being developed that have some of the same mechanisms of action as ketamine, but with different side effects or fewer side effects. So that's one area. There are lots of new medicines. In the last five years, there have been three new treatments for bipolar depression that were uh, all atypical antipsychotics, but um, you know they are useful new treatments for bipolar depression. And uh, the final thing is uh, what you've been uh, referring to, the transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a form of uh, brain stimulation, which you have while awake. You sit in a chair, much like getting your teeth cleaned. When you go to the dentist, you sit in the chair, you're awake, you're alert, and you have this either a helmet or a uh, a, a pad put on your head in a specific spot, and um, it uh, has a rapidly alternating magnetic field which stimulates the brain. And this has been well established as a treatment for depression, regular unipolar depression for a long time. But in, in the recent years, they've uh, discovered two new advances. One is, can you do a lot of it really quickly? Uh, and that has been quite helpful because it shortens the treatment. And the second thing, which is fairly new and just in the last two years, and so far pretty well confined only to regular depression, not to bipolar depression, where you give the uh, like five minutes of stimulation 10 times a day. Uh, and that sounds weird, but uh, it's one week of treatment. So you, you have this treatment um, for five minutes at a time, 10 times during the day for five days. And that is uh, dramatically effective in small studies so far, but has been dramatically effective mainly for unipolar depression. And there's hope that it will work in bipolar depression too. Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you. And so one of the challenges that, that everybody is faced with, uh, or not everybody, many people are faced with, many families are faced with, is getting individuals into treatment and convincing them that they need treatment. And, you know, many questions here about, you know, how do I get my son, my daughter, my spouse, or, you know, somebody into treatment because they've got bipolar disorder and they won't get treated. And how does, how does a family look after someone who is um, struggling with 
the illness, but really is reluctant to get care uh, in that. So I uh, want to get your perspective, uh, Sarah, and, and sort of how, how do we how do we how do we get people? How, what advice do you have for families to you know to to get them into treatment? Uh, you know, Sega was talking about a number of new treatments that are on the horizon, and you know there are many of them are small-ish studies, but we need to get more studies going, and we need more more work in that. But convincing people to get care is often a challenge. Absolutely. And there's two things that that I'll highlight. One is that, you know, getting treatment for many is viewed as very stigmatizing or life changing. And so I think the more that individuals newly diagnosed with bipolar disorder can establish a community or have a peer support who's also living with bipolar disorder to hear what's your experience. Like, I think that single handedly can be one of the most helpful things because when it's family telling you to do it, it feels like, you know, it's like your parents telling you to go to bed at 930 and you don't want to. Right. And so if you can see somebody else who's gone through something that you have as well and, and has is able to show you how treatment was helpful for them, that's key. Second piece is, is I think if you go into a room, room with somebody newly diagnosed with bipolar disorder and say, you need treatment for your bipolar disorder. This is somebody who's grappling with a huge um, life role transition, right? They're grieving their healthy self. And so the more that you can sit in that room and, with that person and say, what's not going, like, what's not going well in your life? Like if, if you could wake up tomorrow and change five things about your life, what would they be? Well, treatment can help with those five things. Like don't necessarily make it about the bipolar disorder, but make it about improving that individual's life and their and reaching their goals. Um, and that can often improve buy-in. Um, and I encourage families to think about that too. Like what, what, what would you like to be, you know, going better in your life? Well, well, maybe that can happen, you know, and, and not make it necessarily about you have bipolar disorder, you need to be in treatment, we don't know what to do with you. Yeah, and I often struggle with uh, some with people that say to me, listen, I want to get off this medication. And so one of the strategies, uh, I like your idea about the goals, because one of the strategies that I've used is to say to someone, uh, being, for example, a student, and say, well, let's let's stay on the medication treatment plan here until you graduate. You know, we've got a graduation and we don't want anything too bad to happen. And so we just use that very simple goal and see Meg smiling and sort of resonating with that a bit, you know. So I, so I think that that that's that's one of the strategic things that I do is say, let's pick a goal and let's let's uh, let's uh, let's go there. And um, so one of the but one of the challenges that that I've seen uh, is uh, the individuals sometimes they just they 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 don't want to get treatment, but they kind of want to keep in touch with the doctor or the treatment team. And so uh, so that's a challenge. Christine, how do we how do we uh, how do we how do we keep people engaged? How do we you know we we you know, we, 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 um, we want, we we're frustrated, you know, they, they don't want to do what we suggest that they do, but we don't want them to just to sail off into the wilderness and, and, and run into problems. How do we keep them engaged? Yeah. Keeping that open door policy of knowing that we're here to support them and we're here to answer their questions is key. Um, but going back to the point about goals, I think sometimes when you talk to an individual about what were they doing when they were feeling well? You know, you know what kinds of things were they enjoying? Uh, the talk, reminding them of what that quality of life looked like when they were well um, will inspire them because they say, you know, my long-term goal is to become X, Y, Z or my long-term goal. And, and when they hold that bigger picture in mind uh, and they realize maybe how far they've come off the mark from, from when they were feeling well, it, it does inspire them to come back um, and, and try treatment. The other thing is, is continuing to track moods. Um, uh, you know, we have on our, on our depression center website, we have a toolkit, um, where people can kind of track their, their sleep and their moods, but there's also apps, um, and other options, journaling, yeah. things of that nature that keep people uh, aware. And then they can really look back and see when they were doing well yeah. compared to while, you know, they're struggling now and come to connect with us again. 
So, you know, so that's, that's a, a excellent points. And so, you know, so Sager, I'm interested in your perspective on this because so, so many people are taking medication and, uh, you know, we're perhaps not the best at uh, kind of measuring how, uh, how effective it is. And so there's a number of questions around, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm experiencing side effects. I'm not, uh, you know, one person is saying their family member is experiencing a lot of anger and resentment around medications and that. So, you know, it's, it's a complex uh, scenario with someone just because they're on medications uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to do well. Uh, so the question I have for you is how do we, how do we, you know, what's the process of keeping a running evaluation and adjusting the medications and so on? Uh, well, f first is systematically writing down, having some kind of a diary or an app where you can not only write down like how many hours of sleep you've been getting and track your mood, but maybe write down side effects uh, and maybe if you started a new treatment, a new medicine, and then so we can more closely link uh, the use or the stoppage of a treatment to some new symptom. The other thing that I found very useful is one of the best psychological treatments for bipolar disorder is something called the Life Goals Program. And that's a, a psychoeducational group program where people learn how to recognize the illness, what to do when the illness is starting to flare up and all that. But a key part of that is uh, in, in those groups, you talk about the pros and cons of each treatment. So you, you have a, a frank discussion. Okay, what benefit do I get from a medicine? What side effects am I getting? And how do I uh, learn to weigh the risks versus the benefit? And if the risks or the harms are outweighing the potential benefits, it's time to move on. You know, so um, having a discussion, often when you meet, you know, a doctor one-on-one, -on -one, um, you have a sort of hurried discussion about these things, but the opportunity to discuss it in some sort of a group where there are also other patients and they can say, well, here are the pros and cons of this treatment or that treatment, um, you know, that it, it's helpful to get that uh, expertise as well as, uh, you know, the kind of rapid fire expertise you might get in a, in a doctor's appointment. Right, right. No, that's uh, that's 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 very helpful. Meg, how do you how do you 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 really were very uh, verbal, uh, very good at sort of just saying, you know, I just these are the medications I need to stay on. Take us through the you know kind of the journey that you had and and the that that's in many many ways it's kind of an acceptance and it's kind of an insight or knowledge on that. What advice do you have for people who are struggling, uh, frankly, with this, and and how can they how can they find resolution? Well, it is a grieving process. It's a letting go. It's a, it's a long letting go of the life you wanted and accepting of a different life. And um, you have to move into a, a new life that you can allow yourself, you know, because a good life is possible, but mm -hmm. you have to allow yourself that life. Um, a good life is possible with bipolar disorder, but you have to allow yourself that life. Wow, fantastic. And so speaking of, of, uh, of life and, and how things go over, over the course of time, I know, Christine, that we've interacted with a number of individuals at various different stages in their lives. And so that, uh, you know, life is, life is different uh, when we're 20, in our 30s and 40s and 50s and so on. To, to share with us some of the observations or the impressions that you've gotten in, in terms of how bipolar disorder affects individuals over the course of their lives. There's a couple of questions about, you know, geriatric uh, sort of old age, uh, you know, versus, you know, uh, patterns and, and what, what happens over the course of time when people, people age. Yeah, um, I definitely think, yeah, there are certain stages and special needs um, that come along the way. So when Meg's talking about that initial um, diagnosis phase and people trying to um, educate themselves and grieve and accept um, that this is a kind of a chronic, you know, relapsing disorder that they will have to actively and proactively treat moving forward. I think during our, um, our young adult um, population, trying to integrate with you know, normal college life of staying up late and wanting to, you know, drink and go to parties, but balancing that with, with remaining well and um, being successful in school. Um, and then we notice a lot with our longitudinal study that a lot of individuals want to give back 
to the research and get engaged in the studies um, once they have children of their own and they're, you know, kind of uh, maybe uh, middle age and um, kind of reflecting on the, the impact of, of the course of illness and um, thinking about future generations and, and impact on them. Um, and then as we age, yeah, um, I think it's important to be working with, you know, uh, geriatric psychiatrists who can um, advise specifically on how the different medications get metabolized differently and how um, if there's mm -hmm. cognitive changes um, that you're noticing that are outside of the normal scope um, to really, um, you know, work with somebody who specializes with, with um, working with older adults. Yeah, we well, mentioned that, that, you know, that, that individuals uh, that when they reach their kind of 30s, 40s, and, and that when they start having kids, you know, then individuals start to worry about, you know, what's going to happen to my kids and that. And so there's that risk. And so, Sarah, how, how do we how do we approach the risk in the younger generation and, the, and children specifically? I mean, we're seeing a, 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 a very worrisome increase in suicidal thinking and thoughts in the uh, in, in, in young and people as young as you know eight, nine and ten years of age it's very concerning and uh, that how are we how how, how, how how do we work with families with bipolar disorder and say say ask us and what's going to happen to my kids and and how am I going to how, how do I how, how do I manage that I mean people are people are desperate sometimes yeah um you know, I, I think it's it's very normal for people, especially when they're thinking about having kids to have many worries, one of which is, you know, am I going to pass this on to my child or, you know, for for women who make the choice to breastfeed, should I do that and be on medications? There, there's all these really complex factors. And I saw some some comments about this in the chat. And then one thing that I'll say is that, you know, psychiatry and OBGYN, I think has become a lot better at working together to try to make sure that people can remain well and have children because nobody should feel like that they can't have children if they have bipolar disorder. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, for families who are grappling with how do I protect my children from getting it right, I know that there's a genetic risk for them to get it. Um, we, you know, we can't predict the future, we, we can't control everything. We are not in a place where we can say this person's going to get it, this person's not going to get it. You know, we do know that there are, are certain things that seem to maybe buffer or help uh, encourage resilience in people. And that's, you know, not using substances at an early age, that's, um, you know, having lots of, of, of healthy uh, emotional support and, um, and creative outlets and, and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we can't control this. And so part of it is also, if, if this were to happen, how could I support my child if they go through it too. Mm. Um, so that's, I, I didn't really touch on the suicide piece, but that's, that's my response to. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And so one of the, one of the points that you brought up is uh, very intriguing about, you know, the question about medication and breastfeeding and that. And so Sagar, lithium is a very common used medication uh, and, and bipolar disorder. And, and what, 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 what do we, what do we advise young parents or mothers specifically with that are taking lithium uh, and, you know, through, through pregnancy and through their breastfeeding or, or what, 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 where are we with that? Well, I, I think this is a, a, a big topic of concern to everybody. And so fortunately, there is a lot of guidance now about uh, if, if you wish to become pregnant and you have bipolar disorder, how do you handle it? Uh, and there are ways. Uh, there are ways where you look at the risks of getting ill, how many episodes you've had, and uh, you you meticulously follow good life routines, you know, like we've talked about before about sleep wake regulation. Uh, we particularly know that the first trimester of pregnancy is the time when organs are being formed, and that's the most vulnerable time um, in, in in development. So, if possible, we try to minimize or stop medication use during the first trimester. We can't do that for everyone. And we do know that uh, a number of medicines, particularly atypical antipsychotics, but uh, yes, even lithium can be used safely during pregnancy all the way through. And we, again, we weigh risk versus benefit. If someone has had four hospitalizations and they were very ill during those hospitalizations, 
I don't think they can survive, uh, you know, tapering off and uh, an extended period off medicine um, while getting pregnant. But on the other hand, somebody who might have had, you know, no hospitalizations or perhaps one, you know, five or seven years ago, and now they have a very healthy lifestyle and they've been pretty stable for the last couple of years with maybe only one treatment, uh, maybe they can be tapered off medicine for a time for some time. And uh, we usually actually plan this in advance with uh, what we call a pregnancy contract, where we identify uh, in writing with, with the patient and their family, uh, what are their symptoms when they get high? What are their symptoms when they get low? And what would they like to be treated with if they get ill during pregnancy? So it's already pre-specified uh, how to handle that. Uh, so we have a lot of guidance now on how to handle pregnancy and medicines in pregnancy and we have specific information on different medicines and how they're excreted uh, or not in breast milk. And so we can give pretty specific advice about breastfeeding uh, and medication use. Thank you. And, and we, we are very fortunate here at the University of Michigan. We have a perinatal team that really uh, is focused on, on women uh, in this perinatal period. And I, I just have to acknowledge, I had a patient that convinced me that it was very important for her to go off um, her, her lithium. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we did it in a very strategic way, gradually decreasing it. And sadly, she still had problems uh, with it. It didn't prevent any uh, emergence of, of mood. So uh, I, um, I have a history of failing. Uh, with that, uh, with with at least this one one example. So it's um, it's my my preference now to really very carefully give consideration to the pattern, as you say, Sagar, and 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 um, and how how best to um, to do that. So um, the it's an interesting question about institutionalization, and it's perhaps more of a historical question in, in past and present. And so there are individuals that have really difficult patterns. I mean, bipolar disorder is a wide spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of the illness. And so there are individuals that have a history of, of very difficult um, challenges and others that do, do well. Um, and so if somebody wants to take on the concept of institutionalization now and how uh, longer term rehabilitation programs, and this goes into also the problem of cost and, and, uh, and everything like that. Are there, is there a role for long term care uh, in bipolar disorder? Is there a role uh, for someone who needs? So, you know, Melvin, so I, I'm going to turn your question on its head. I think we've been talking a lot about how serious bipolar disorder is, and sure, sure, it's serious, but I can't tell you how many patients I've seen who do well. You know, mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've treated bipolar disorder for 30 years. Uh, I've had, I've usually worked in an academic uh, center, so I've had lots and lots of students, and I can say I'm very happy to see how many of them have gone on they finish degrees, they've started families, they bring in pictures of their family. And, you know, um, the majority of people with bipolar disorder do well. And I think we have to emphasize that. And, and uh, really, uh, I think it's a good news story that we do have many treatments that work well, and we have many people who do well. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, that's a great, you, thank you for doing that. That's a that's a you know, and that's exactly right why we have the panel uh, here to uh, to keep ourselves balanced. And so, uh, you know, Meg, I've called upon you from time to time uh, that we, you know, I don't know whether you were participant in or on our energy um, uh, symposia that we had last year. Were you? Did you? Did you see no. that? So we had a wonderful symposia last year about energy and art, and there were so many wonderful people that contributed their art to the uh, um, uh, to the you know to this um, symposia and talked about how they it, use art and the expression of art in their uh, in their um, the life and how that benefited their. Um, you know, style of living and that. So there's many, many different ways that people cope with that. And you mentioned about, you know, the routine, Meg, and, and that, and, and uh, I know you're a writer as well. And so that's mm -hmm. something that is a motivator uh, for you. And, and, um, and so it's the expression of art that, that is, is really terrific, I think, for you, right? 
Uh, yeah. And I'm actually pursuing a master's, you know, I, mm. I hope to someday be published. Mm -hmm. um, like, I love it. You know, it's a huge part of my life. And um, like, I, I consider it, you know, I didn't have children. Like that was a decision my husband and I decided not to make. Mm -hmm. um, so art has become an outlet. Phenomenal. And I thank Stephanie Prechter for putting the uh, energy brain health uh, on the, um, uh, in the chat box. And, and, um, and a thank you to Leon, who is very complimentary of your writing, uh, Meg, and that. So uh, terrific. Very good. Very good. And I want to thank Sager for pointing this out, that uh, there are many people that, that thrive and do well with, uh, with bipolar, uh, living with bipolar disorder. And uh, we, we are, in a, you know, in an academic uh, setting, often we see the challenging situations and, and that, but um, to that point, Christine, you interact with a lot of families uh, and that, and we see people go forward and thrive. Uh, and uh, what, what are the, what are the positive of stories that um, that you hear. You know, we have so many people that are highly successful and um, and doing well and want to contribute to the to the research um, to kind of share their stories. But um, I think I've seen a lot in the past. I've seen um, support groups that have been led where individuals come back. Just basically, they've been very stable for a long time, but they've been able to help newly diagnosed individuals by saying what's worked well for them um, and to inspire them um, about, you know, the career path they've taken or the goals that they've achieved in their life. I think that is really important to remind individuals in the midst of a crisis, just exactly what you're saying, how many people are so highly successful and doing so well uh, living with bipolar disorder and, you know, extremely resilient. Perfect. And that's, uh, that's, that's, it's really, truly an honor to hear those stories. Now, Sarah, in, in thinking through how to keep the individual that's doing well, uh, doing well, or keep them, keeping them well. So one of the points that I brought up on a, on a slide was the, the ability to predict how can we, what can we do to anticipate problems, if you will, because, uh, you know, in, in the normal course of life, it's, uh, there are challenges and, uh, you know, um, things hit, you know, uh, we get flat tires, um, you, you know, and that, if you will. How are we, how, take me through kind of, you know, what would be a process to help us predict when problems are coming on or figure out ways to keep things on track and, and, and that, how do we, how do we help people in that domain? Well, I think Christine has been talking about one of the key things, which is ongoing monitoring. Um, and I think even when we're doing well, we need to keep that, you know, ongoing monitoring happening. So like if you if you do an analogy of, of exercise, right, let's say you're somebody who who exercises three times, three to five times a week, that's a part of your routine. And, you know, you lose your 20 pounds, you're feeling good about your muscles. And so then you stop going to the gym because you're like, I hit my goal. Um, well, guess what's going to happen? Probably over a series of months, you're going to put back on weight. Your, you know, the, the lean muscle you developed is going to be replaced by fat. And, um, and then you're going to have to start all over again. And, and the same is true of, of mood. So when you're going well, when things are going well, you want to keep monitoring and doing those things that have kept you well to keep you uh, doing well in the future. But things happen, stressors happen, major role transitions happen, the pandemic happened, you know, things destabilize your social rhythms. And so, you know, my recommendation is people, that's, that's where relapse prevention plans come in. That's where, you know, you work with your therapist to know what are my early warning signs and, and if I'm ongoing monitoring and those early warning signs happen, what, what skills do I know, know I need to concentrate on? Right now, maybe I need to go back and read my sheet about sleep hygiene and remind myself to improve my sleep schedule. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to concentrate on eating healthy. Maybe I need to um, call my psychiatrist and talk about my medication dosages. What, what has worked um, you know, for me in the past when things start going off track? but you don't know if things are going to go off track unless you pay attention to previous patterns. And that's why the longitudinal yeah. study is so important because 
you know, for me to be able to sit and show you, well, the last four depressive episodes came after a life destabilizing event. Um, you know, that's, that's showing you that if you know, a big change is coming up, you need to, um, you know, put in place some, some security and I'm going to, I know I'm talking a lot, but I want to give one more metaphor that I just love. I tell all of my clients, I tell anybody who considers any mental health disorder, there's fire extinguishers and there's fire retardants, right? If we always wait for the fire to start and we only have fire extinguisher coping skills, right? How do we deal with this stress in the moment? those fires are going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and happen. We need fire retardants, right? We need things that if, if a little match gets lit, either the fire doesn't really fully burn, there's just some embers, right? We don't get to that point. And so the ongoing healthy sleep, healthy eating, exercise, staying on medications, having creative outlets, doing things that give your life purpose are the fire ex, uh, retardant. <laughs> um, so that's no, a terrific <laughs> answer. They're, they're very excellent points. And so uh, one of our one of our listeners um, attendees uh, brought back the institutional question with a with a with a specific question. I think it's a valid question. Are there positive institutional environments? In other words, are there are there examples of um, environments in a, in a, if you will, in an institutional? And by this, I think you're meaning just longer term care entities. And and the answer to that question is is problematic at one level because it's really discriminatory and it's financially driven. So that many of these these environments that are um, longer term, they're if they're difficult uh, in the context of being paid for uh, by the insurances, and uh, so so that's a that's a challenging question. Uh, then there becomes a question: of What about care homes? I know that in the I believe it's in Oakland County, Kadima, they have a series of of, um, of um, apartments and homes that 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 people with mental illnesses uh, live in, and 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 they have a strategic plan there for you know for for you know caring uh, of these individuals, and so it's a very complex, um, very complex uh, phenomenon. And so, if one has a family member, I think that has bipolar disorder that is chronic and difficult, uh, and you know on that on that far end. And one really needs to to um, you know work with the to the care providers that you have and and um, social workers and social um, um, uh, people that know what what the environment is or what the what, what things are to try to find the best alternative and and so Sagar I don't know whether what your you know perspective uh, would be on that I mean you you've got the Canadian experience as well perhaps they have more. Um, better longer term institutional uh, providing systems can that compared to the US? I don't know. Well, I, I think there are two different uh, types of longer term care. So the first thing to know is that some people have uh, uh, are refractory to many of the treatments that we give. And, you know, our current healthcare environment is get people in and out of hospital in, you know, four days, seven days. And that's not very therapeutic. Uh, for many people. Uh, so if someone has had a lot of episodes or very difficult to control episodes, particularly early in the course of illness, then there are specialized, more acute care hospitals, but th that specialize in one month to three months kinds of hospitalizations, which can be extremely beneficial. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the US, of course, cost is an issue. Um, the second part is, of course, are there individuals later who've had the illness for a long time? And they've had uh, lots of complications and all that. Well, sure. And, uh, but, you know, that's no different than any other medical illness. I mean, there are people who've had uh, long-term cardiac disease or diabetes, and at some point they need to be in a nursing home or some other facility because the illness has, uh, you know, insulted them in so many different ways. So, the appropriate thing is if someone's quite disabled by their symptoms and the consequences of the the illness, then, you know, you need to think of all care options and long-term institutional care is appropriate. But that's, I would say that's, you know, like 2% of the population of, of individuals with bipolar disorder. Can I address this, Melvin? Please, yes. Um, Like... I was actually a resident at Kadima 
um, and I'm now working full time. Um, so I have progressed. Um, so for a time it was necessary, but it's no longer necessary. Um, it was necessary for a time, like, but, you know, I have moved oh. on. Yeah, no, it's terrific, and uh, I, I, um, and we, we, we know the people at uh, Kadima and, and uh, met them and actually participated in community events uh, with them. A phenomenal uh, group of people, and I think it's, that it's a very uh, good place. It's a very good place, and they're very, they're very kind and wonderful in every way. And I think that what I want to emphasize with that, and so in in uh, um, uh, the is the the. Um, uh, the importance of learning about the facilities, importance of learning of what's best, and importance of, of making a family-oriented uh, decision as to you know what what the what what is the what are, what are the best options and and you know for that. The thing that I have been impressed with is, is that how much more how much better people do when they have a family behind them. How much better people. Uh, you know, if they how they progress. And so I want to encourage everyone to, you know, really amplify their relationships, you know, within the families and pay attention to families and pay attention to that. And it is so distressing when when someone with bipolar disorder, you know, has burned bridges and people with bipolar disorder can behave in manners that cause them to cause bridges to burn and challenges. And uh, there are so many examples of families with people, of people that do well because of the family support. So it's very important. But getting information is really critical uh, about that. And I see there's a question about hospitalization. People have variable different experiences with hospitalization. And that just has to be recognized that uh, hospitalizations are, are can be challenged, challenging. So we're coming back, coming down to the uh, seven fifty-five. We're five minutes to the top of the hour, and uh, I, I just want to, you know, ask of, of the panelists if there are any burning points that they would like to address in conclusions, and you know the. Uh, and that's so um, I'll just start from on the opposite end. Christine, closing points. Yeah, I just I think we've covered a lot. Um, I, I, I see there are still a lot of questions we have not covered, um, but I would echo that the outcomes are so much better when somebody has a an advocate in their in place and when when loved ones can separate the disease process from, um, you know, from the person just being difficult or challenging or, yeah. um, so those that stand by the side of, of their loved one, even in crisis, their outcomes are so much better. Um, and so I think, I, I guess I, my closing point would be to thank the, the loved ones um, who are listening you, um, and supporting um, those living with bipolar disorder. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, first I'll, I'll put a plug that I responded to everybody's sleep questions in the chat. Um, and so I would be happy to follow up about that. I know we didn't have time to talk about it. My message is that as somebody who is primarily a researcher, but also a clinician, um, hearing about the lived experience from people who are willing to talk about the trials, the tribulations, what has made them well, what has made them not well, um, hearing what you want to know, what you're passionate about, what you need is what drives me to do the research I do. And so I'm so grateful to be involved in events like this and have people like Meg who are willing to, to come on here and share their stories because otherwise our research doesn't matter. Um, you know, we, we need to, to hear your stories to be able to make meaningful change. So thank you to those who are living with bipolar disorder who were very open and honest in the chat um, with their experiences. Thank you, Sagar. So uh, I, I would just like to close by reminding people that there are a couple of resources that could be very helpful. So one is that the International Society for Bipolar Disorders, ISBD, has a very good website and it has a lot of patient information and family information. That's one resource, the International Society for Bipolar Disorders. And the 
single best booklet on bipolar disorder is something called the CANMAT Patient and Family Guide to Bipolar Disorder. This is a booklet that is written in collaboratively by uh, clinicians and patients. And it, it, uh, it's very up to date about the latest medical treatments, psychotherapies, mood monitoring, uh, and also issues for what families uh, or tips for what families can do or say to people who are not interested in treatment and all those kinds of common questions and challenges that came up today. So, it's, mm -hmm. so if you Google search it, it's free online. Uh, if you Google search CANMAT, C-A-N-M-A-T, Patient and Family Guide to Bipolar Disorder, uh, you can, it's actually posted at multiple sites, but uh, one of them is the CANMAT website. Uh, you can download it for free and uh, it's available in English, French, and Chinese. Thank you very much, Sagar. And so Meg, uh, the closing comments uh, are afforded to you. Thank you. Firstly, thank you for sharing your stories uh, with us. Thank and you. thank, thank you so, for being I'm here. I'm so honored to be here. Um, like there is hope for this diagnosis. You know, there really is. And with loved one support, you can live a good life. Um, it's not gonna be easy, but it is possible. That's uh, that, that that's that's a very very good statement. It's not going to be easy, but it, it's possible, uh, and that. So I want to just thank everyone for uh, attending. I want to specifically just thank the panelists for contributing their evening uh, to this uh, to this webinar. I want to specifically and and in particular to thank Amanda Hudek for all the uh, work behind the scenes and getting this done. This would not have gone so smoothly if Amanda hadn't have been on our case to get this uh, going. I also want to thank Holly Bertram uh, for all her help and Lisa who worked uh, with everyone behind the scenes to to make this evening uh, possible. So thank you everyone. And I think Amanda, we were going to just close with that. If you that, if you were going to try this sort of short little video that talks a little bit about the Prector program, and so, do you want to see if that is going to play, or shall we? There we go. Thank you. 
Well, again, I just want to thank everyone for attending this evening. It was a pleasure to to be here and to um, to meet with you. And again, I thank the panel and everyone um, for for everything that they've done to make this possible. So I just wish everyone a good night. Thank you very much.